This is BYU Sports Nation, brought to you by the BYU Store, simulcast on BYU-TV and BYU-Radio. Now, from Studio B, here's Spencer Linton and Jerem Jordan. BYU Sports Station is live. Your day-to-day play-by-play in Studio B, presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Thursday, July 30th, wherever and however you're connected, great to have you with us. I am Spencer Linton, teamed up with a Zen master of troll job social media, Jerem Jordan. I wish I was better at it. I think I could really use that skill on social media, but you know who's really good at it? The Dodgers announcers. So your boy Joe Davis and Oral Hershiser. Last night, the Dodgers are playing the Astros. Dodgers uh, win that game in uh, extras in 13, despite the start a runner on second thing in extra innings this year, which is interesting. But Jose Altuve strikes out. And uh, Oral Hershiser ends up saying, guessing is harder than knowing. <laughs> wow. Wow. Bang the trash can. Yeah, pretty funny. I, I would love if someone snuck in and did that now. That'd be so funny. <laughs> because every, you heard it with a massive crowd, <laughs> let alone no crowd. That would be really funny. The Astros are fortunate that there is only a 60-game Major League Baseball season. No, they're lucky there's no fans. Because that they too. would have heard it all year. And... Joe Kelly is kind of my hero right now. I'll just leave it at that. Eight game suspension, well worth it. Eight games more than any Astro. And a fan account on Instagram that uh, took it to another level. Yes. <laughs> he apologizes to absolutely no one. <laughs> Interesting stuff. Pretty funny. Uh, guess what's on today's show lineup, Jerem? You don't have to ask me this. I know. You know. Yeah, yeah. So I am aware. You like the Astros uh, have a serious advantage. All I heard was you like the Astros. <laughs> I do not like the Astros. In fact, it's kind of the opposite. Your Mariners ended like a 15-game losing streak to them uh, yeah, a few days back. Yeah, so means, congratulations on that. Means nothing. Yeah, no guessing here for Jerem. Uh, what will the BYU football schedule look like now? Plenty of guessing involved there. More power conferences announcing or set to announce their 2020 plans. Chris Vanini of The Athletic will join us to discuss that very thing and why he's a Taysom Hill type. Plus another best to wear at doubleheader and coaches on bikes. Day four. Bring on your Thursday BYU Sports Nation headlines. The ACC announces its football schedule model, which is a 10-conference game schedule and one non-conference game at home for each school. Notre Dame is included in the schedule, by the way, eligible to play for the ACC title. They had an existing five-games-a-year relationship, and they could fill the ACC's New Year's Six spot as well. So this isn't out of the blue, but look at Notre Dame essentially in the, well, they are in the ACC this season. Sports Illustrated reports the almighty SEC is now leaning towards a conference-only football schedule format of 10 games. Presidents of all 14 Southeastern Conference schools will meet today to discuss all of the options. This carries significant ramifications for BYU with a potential season opener against Alabama and, of course, the last Power 5 game BYU has remaining on its current schedule, Missouri, scheduled to play in Provo this October. We wait and watch. Utah State announced the transfer of Devontae Henry Cole to Logan from Brigham after the Cougars signed the grad transfer running back from Utah. So, three schools in one year. There you go. His best buddy, Jason Shelley, is up there playing quarterback. Yeah. Girlfriend up there. Yeah. Uh, he essentially came to BYU, took some pictures. And then I don't think he ever enrolled here. I think it was planning on coming for the fall semester, but uh, DHC, one of the greats, gone way too soon. (laughs) Yesterday, sources indicated Jimmer Fredette would sign a $1.6 million deal with the Shanghai Sharks and return to play in China. However, since the initial report surfaced, Jimmer's agent has denied claims of any Jimmer agreement with Shanghai. Interesting. So we wait and see what happens there, too. Of course, Fredette played last year in Greece with one of the EuroLeague powers, Panathinaikos. All rise and shout. It's time for What's Trending. You're talking about it, and so are we. It's What's Trending on BYU Sports Nation. ACCU later, another Power 5 conference circling the wagons and narrows the circle of trust. The ACC, while harboring Notre Dame, will play a conference-only schedule in 2020, plus one game outside of conference, as long as it's a home game for the ACC team. 
BYU doesn't have an ACC opponent on the schedule, but this certainly may impact what the SEC and Big 12 conferences decide to do in the very near future. Jerem, what is your reaction to the ACC and other college football news yesterday? And more importantly, how it affects BYU? I have questions for the ACC. So they obviously want to keep some of the rivalries that they have with the SEC. Those are Georgia, Georgia Tech, Clemson, South Carolina, Florida, Florida State, Kentucky, Louisville. Um, then you have the Big 12. There's Missouri, Kansas, and then Texas and Texas A&M don't play. But that, those are the rivalries that they were hoping to keep intact. So every ACC team is going to have to host the SEC team. That ain't happening unless that was the year they were going to already. So that's interesting. I am glad that the ACC is saying plus one non-con because there is a possibility of BYU being involved there. Sure. Although we weren't talking about any ACC teams per se, but in week two, Virginia Tech is apparently available. And in week four, Miami is available. So those are two SEC, ACC possibilities. The SEC is going to be the interesting one because, as you mentioned, Missouri is already on the schedule for BYU. Of course, reports of BYU-Alabama in week one that we've talked about a lot, which would be uh, arguably the greatest team BYU has ever played in week one in its history. Um, that would be interesting. That would be awesome, right? But it makes sense to control it. If I'm, if I'm uh, you know, a member of a Power 5 league, it makes sense to just let's do our thing, and then if we have one more cool they, they aren't going to play 11 games in all reality, though. I don't, I don't see how that's actually going to happen. I like the ambition. I'm a little surprised it's not like 8 plus 1, but might as well st- start high, and then you'll just trim down from there. I, let's all hope the SEC does a plus 1 as well so that Alabama can happen. If they don't do a plus 2, then there's only one SEC game for BYU out there potentially. And would they keep the Missouri game if that's the case and not have Alabama? Or do you say, hey, Missouri, let's play another year? because we have this opportunity with Alabama. The, the, the fear is today that the SEC goes, okay, it's plus one. So then BYU has to make that decision. What do we do? Do we keep Missouri in that existing contract, or do we somehow get out of it or delay so that we can play Alabama? If you're BYU, you need the SEC to play that because you don't want the domino to somehow be group of fives also go to conference only-ish, and then is BYU playing this independent schedule that – is just what they can manage this year. There's a lot of questions to be had, but dominoes are continuing to fall because, as you mentioned yesterday, hey, you got to figure this out in the next week so that if you play in week zero or one, you have four weeks. But for the Pac-12, they're not going to play till what, week seven or something? Or, sorry, week three of yeah. the, or four of the conference schedule? So it's time to make some decisions. Let's go. I mean, technically speaking, BYU could opt to go to Missouri and play that game, and they could still play at Alabama, right? Because Oh, they could do the two. It would yeah, be yeah. those okay. teams' specific plus one game, but BYU would have to go on the road to Missouri right. if the SEC right. opts for a, hey, we'll do a plus one, but you got to come here. So who is, yeah, BYU, what this means, and what you said is exactly right. Yeah, BYU is not a member of the SEC. They don't, aren't, aren't limited to them. It means that BYU is probably not going to play a Power 5 game at home. I wouldn't expect that at this point, unless something happens with the Big 12 that's unforeseen. The ACC could technically schedule BYU for a home game. So maybe like our friends at FB Schedule said the other day, and boy, their lives are busy right now. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) I saw a GIF come out from them yesterday of a guy just chucking a computer in anger. (laughs) (laughs) They live on schedules, and they're all disrupted. Normally right now, by the way, we're talking fall camp. It's going to start tomorrow-ish. We don't know who BYU's going to play. We don't even know who BYU's going to play. FB Schedules doesn't know who everybody's going to play and when they're going to play. Crazy. Yeah, so they suggested that BYU in week four would go take on Boston College, who had a need in week four. And it's like, okay, yeah, BYU could go to Chestnut Hill and play there as long as BYU meets the protocol and the medical requirements that are set up by the ACC whenever they're agreed upon. Okay, great. Yeah, BYU could pick up a road game. But, man, now you're talking about BYU going to Chestnut Hill and maybe to Missouri and then to Tuscaloosa. Like, it, what does my shirt say again? <laughs> Yeah, BYU is just going to have to uh, bend to everyone else's will on this. Yeah, it feels like that. Being being independent right now is not a great thing. But This specific year. I mean, there are other years where it could be awesome, right? And and you feel like it's better than Mountain West in XYZ ways. But this this is tough, man. This is tough right now for BYU trying to figure this out without a league. With the ACC announcement... It makes you wonder, okay, what can BYU do there? But this is more about what the SEC and the Big 12 will do in the latest 
power five domino falling situation. If the SEC goes conference only, BYU's, like you said, BYU is going to have no power five games left. They will have lost all six power five games on the originally scheduled slate in 2020. And it stings that BYU wouldn't have a home power five game at all. Like that, the, the buildup in independence has been, Hey, you just wait until we get to 2020 and 2021. You've been talking about 21 for a while. All of these teams start to come to Provo. It's going to be fantastic. But it it brings back shades of early independence, specifically 2015, which takes us to our stat of the day. It's the BYU Sports Nation stat of the day. 2015 is the only season in BYU independence the Cougars did not have a Power 5 home game. Granted, there were no COVID-19 pandemic scenarios in play. How you go 6-0 at home? But they were undefeated. They were undefeated at home. So you have a freshman quarterback in Tanner Mangum that starts 12 games and BYU still wins 9 games. That's how. You play six non-Power 5 home games. Then it's easier. It's I, What I'm proposing is not a crazy formula. Fewer Power 5s equals more wins, generally speaking. Ross, it's not crazy. Ross Dellinger adds this on the SEC conference-only and potential ripple effect. A conference-only schedule, however, has emerged as a potential best option, even though all league administrators are not necessarily in agreement. That doesn't matter. The presidents of the school are the ones that matter most. Well... And even then, you don't have to come to consensus. You just have whatever their governing body decides they're going to do. Trust me, when in your house, see if you get consensus on everything today <laughs> with your spouse and your kids. No, it's what the parents decide, and then you kind of go from there, right? Yeah. I was a little bit shocked to hear that the SEC is going to go conference only because I thought they were on board to do something with the ACC where it's well, like, hey, no, we want to keep those, at least those traditional games in play on top of our conference play. Yeah, and there are some SEC teams whose, uh, you know, they play their own rivalries uh, within the league, right? And within their division, some not. But, yeah, Alabama's uh, main rival is Auburn, right? And they have other rivalries, but that's in league. Like, they're going to, they're in the same division. They play them every year regardless. So, hopefully, BYU can play Alabama. Hopefully, BYU can play Missouri. I'd love to see Utah State and Boise State still. Hopefully, we have some semblance of this. But this is all really nice and cute for now because guess what's going to happen? Let's say BYU does have a 10-game schedule Mm -hmm. in a week and a half or Mm -hmm. something. BYU is going to get some positive tests and not be able to play a game or something like the Marlins did. Which, by the way, can someone tell me how many positive tests means you can't play? Or is it how many people were exposed? Like, no no one said anything relative to this. How many people the have Marlins gone to had the like hospital? 18, and so it was like, oh, it's like that's a ravaging lot. the team. Yeah, that's a lot. But what if it was only nine? Then what? Like, no one – is there a line? Like, who's making that call? Is BYU going to have a group text like the Marlins did to decide whether they play? Uh, no. There should be other protocols in place. Isaiah Kafuzi is like, yeah, we should play. It's like, wait, we should probably figure it's this tough, out. tough because, again, we only hear about the number of positive tests, but then we don't hear really anything after that. So would you feel differently if it was, it was sick enough to be in the hospital? The Marlins yeah. had 18 positive tests, but none of them were sick for longer than a couple of days, and none of them went to the hospital. Would and they, they all stayed home, and they whatever. Would people feel differently about it then? Because a positive test is not the concern to me. It's the spread to someone yes. who could die. It's the ramifications, that's, the that's, potential. Yes, a positive test is not a, as big a deal to me. It's, it's containing that person so that they don't spread it to, to someone who could have a major health issue. Because these athletes are not the ones that are going to have a major health issue. They are the most peak fit people in these United States of America. It's the it's vulnerable. that they will give it to grandma, right? That, that they will give it to someone else who gives it to someone or else. Or coach. You, or coach, right, and administrate it. That's where there's real fear for me of, okay, we got to be careful. Because let's be honest, we, don't, we care about the health of this, but we're disregarding some of it. We want football to happen. If it was 100% about health, we wouldn't play at all. But it's not. There's money involved, of course. The stability of not only uh, the schools and the people who work at the schools, but the emotional and mental health of people with football, whether it's fan or an athlete. The economy. But that all is, you know, it, it depends what you value the most. And all of that uh, weighs in. And now we don't know who BYU is playing. And even if they have a schedule, there's going to be games that probably get canceled. Well, and then there are the ideas that were floated out on the Twitter machine yesterday of, 
couldn't a conference include BYU like eight, the ACC did with Notre Dame? We will discuss that later. What are the possibilities for BYU following suit to Notre Dame? And is there a conference out there that would welcome the Cougars? <laughs> into a scenario like that. Our question of the day, taking into consideration what we know now, what do you want to see BYU do with their 2020 football schedule? Let's go to Voice of the Nation. This is the Voice of the Nation on BYU Sports Nation. At Rubioso BYU Answers on Twitter. The SEC news is purely speculative, but having an immediate contingency plan would be good. Alabama is a pricey steak dinner that would be great to have, but at this point, I'll take the filet of fish <laughs> as it is still somewhat satisfying. Well, let's get Dixie on there then. Let's go. <laughs> Coming up, coaches on bikes, day four. Plus, college football insider Chris Vanini from The Athletic. What does the latest round of Power 5 news mean for the future of BYU football scheduling? We'll ask him. This is BYU Sports Nation. Paul Peterson, let's go, baby. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, the official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. For Cougar Sports games, highlights, interviews, and archive content, subscribe to the BYU TV Sports YouTube channel today. If you haven't figured it out yet, we are live in Studio B, and this is your day-to-day BYU Sports play-by-play. I'm Spencer Linton alongside Jerem Jordan. Joining us now on the Deseret First Credit Union Hotline, Via Zoom is National College Football Insider and Reporter for The Athletic. His name is Chris Vanini. Chris, great to have you back on BYU Sports Nation. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Now we got some uh, some real football stuff to talk about. Holy cow. And we're hoping that BYU has an actual football schedule uh, to play against. Uh, but here we are wondering what the Cougars are going to do. We'll get to that in just a moment, but I want to start here, Chris. Your Twitter bio says that you are a Taysom Hill type. That resonates with BYU fans, so please expound on what you mean there. It, it means I'm versatile. It means I can play multiple positions, and <laughs> you put me where you need me, and I, I can make a place somewhere. <laughs> Physically, is there a comp there? Or? Uh, I mean, I, I don't think I'm good enough to play in the NFL, so... <laughs> Probably not in that sense. <laughs> Taysom Hill, one, perhaps the greatest athlete in BYU history. He was amazing. Okay, let's uh, get to the news. So, obviously, the ACC says, okay, conference only plus one. They want to preserve some of those SEC rivalries and whatnot, right? Uh, and then the ACC, rumors of a conference only, uh, plus one, and so on and so forth. So, uh, what's your reaction to the news that's coming out as more dominoes fall as we get closer to knowing what schedules are going to be played? I think my biggest takeaway from the ACC news yesterday was that nobody knows what anybody else is doing and the communication is very poor. Uh, even, even coming out of Tuesday's AD meeting, there were people who didn't think the ACC would make a decision. Obviously, the SEC didn't quite know this was coming. There had been talk about the schedule alliance. The plus one puts pressure on them now. You know, a couple of weeks ago, the Big Ten surprised everybody with their moves. So it just kind of highlights that everybody's really just working on their own here. You've got different start dates for each conference, depending on on what you do. So I think it's a good plan by the ACC. I think it was probably the best plan they could probably go forward with, especially getting Notre Dame. And there was obviously a big get for them, but, but uh, it just feels like round and round we go every day. Someone else is doing something different. And and speaking of uh, someone else and potentially doing something different. Now the question turns to, what is the SEC, the, the good old boys in the Southeastern Conference, Alabama and Tennessee's and Florida's and Georgia's and all of these historic programs, what do you think they're going to do, Chris, in light of what the ACC announced yesterday? Well, the, the presidents meet today. There's a decent chance they could make a decision today. It's always possible they don't. Uh, but, yeah, the ACC decision puts a lot of pressure on them. There, there are those in interconference rivalry games, your South Carolina Clemson's, your Georgia, Georgia Techs, those matter to a lot of people in those states. And if the SEC decides to do conference only, and the SEC is the reason that those games don't happen, you're going to have a lot of local politicians that are mad. They've already spoken up on some of this stuff before. So it was really a shrewd move by the ACC. Uh, Obviously, you know, I'm sure the SEC would have liked some communication on that before they figured out what everybody was doing. Uh, But We'll see. We'll see what the SEC does today. It's probably either conference only or a plus one. But uh, as with all these things, they seem to change by the day. The ACC made a massive power move in saying, okay, you can 
we're going to do a, a plus one non-conference game, but it's got to be a home game. So the ACC team is saying they've got to host the SEC team in that rivalry, right? That's that's a power move from the ACC. Yeah, and, and the ACC already is scheduled to host a number of those those SEC rivalry games already this year. I'm sure that was one reason that they were okay with doing that right now. It's an easier decision for them when they have the game at home, when they have the, the game on their TV inventory. Uh, but – yeah, it, it does play into it. It does, it does, but it does open the door for the the, the in-state games because South Carolina, Clemson, that's in the same state no matter what. Georgia, Georgia Tech, Florida, Florida State, those games are in the same state no matter what. Uh, so I, I think they can work around it, but it certainly was easier for the ACC to make this call. Do you feel like the Pac-12 and Big Ten jumped the gun in that regard? Because at least in the Pac-12, for us, we're saying, why can't BYU and Utah play? They're, it's li- literally a 45-minute drive. Um, you know, right now, maybe an hour with traffic. But Utah flying to L.A. makes no sense compared to uh, playing BYU. Did the ACC perhaps learn a little bit in, well, we want to preserve some non-conference rivalries, or maybe they just have more in that area of the country? I mean, it, I'm sure it played a role, but the, the biggest thing in terms of the Big Ten and the Pac-12 doing what they did was safety was a factor, but the biggest factor was schedule flexibility being able to work with teams you work with as a group on all sorts of types of issues, people who are already on the same page. You can change games if you need to. You can replace opponents if you need to. They all work together as a group already. The flexibility was a big part of this because there's a lot of, you know, a group, a game against a group of five team or a BYU gets, gets canceled and it's like, hey, we're just right down the road. We're doing the same testing. Why can't we, we do that? And yeah, the ACC is keeping the door open for that types of things, but the Big Ten felt coming off of the Ivy League news a a few days prior that someone needed to make a decision because had the Big Ten not done that or the Pac-12, who knows where we'd be now because, you know, obviously everybody's just kind of waiting and waiting and hoping we get to fall camp, hoping we get to the season, and the wheels needed to start turning. Chris Vanini, college football insider and writer for The Athletic with us on BYU Sports Nation. The Cougars, as you well know, Chris, said goodbye to three games with the Pac-12 and two with the Big Ten and are now kind of uh, almost preparing to hear that they won't play Missouri or have that uh, possibility of Alabama in week one. So BYU fans are kind of scrambling, but then they look at Notre Dame and the ACC and say, well, isn't there a conference that would that would welcome BYU and, and, and do this if BYU offered up their ESPN money and – and somehow they could come to some type of collaborative effort. Is there a conference that would best fit BYU scenario that it could be a mutually beneficial situation for the conference and BYU? I, I can't say I'm aware if any of that is happening up front, but the place it would make the most sense would obviously be the Mountain West because of the, the previous ties there, because of the location, because of the TV money. Notre Dame's TV money, it's not quite – conference level money but it's still big money that was the big factor that the acc needed to work out in bringing them already in bringing them in notre dame also already plays five acc games a year so you know it's not as big of a jump compared to what byu going into another conference would be the, the independents outside of notre dame are in a in a really tough spot uh, i i think it, w- it could make sense if the Mountain West and BYU decided to do that. I'm not, obviously there's a lot of different machinations that need to go on for that to happen. But just hypothetically, you know, if I'm BYU, that feels like that might be the the safest bet if you can do that. But you've got, you've got game contracts, you got to figure out already. There's a whole host of issues. It's a very complicated thing if that were to happen. Let's talk about the Big 12 because they're an interesting one that uh, has said a little bit, uh, you know, in terms of reports uh, leaked or rumors and whatnot. But um, they're unique in that they only have uh, the 10 teams. So how do you see that potentially shaking out? Yeah, I mean, the Big 12, you know, the ACC pushed things back a week. The Pac-12 pushed things back to late September. The Big 12 is going the other way. They, they've scheduled some week zero games. That Kansas added Southern Illinois, or I think they may have moved that. Uh, Oklahoma moved its Missouri State game up. Um, there has been talk about TCU UNLV, but that's not official. We don't know if that's actually happening yet. So 
you know, the Big 12, yeah, they only have 10 teams. They only play nine conference games. They may try to ha- keep some of those group of five games that they already have on the schedule or FCS games. And, and they're, they're, they're one we're still not sure about. They, they appear to be the last Power Five league that's going to make a decision. Chris, you mentioned that the communication has been porous, and that's probably putting it lightly between all of these Power Five conferences. And it's easy to point that there's no really central governing figure for Power Five college football. So uh, in your educated, uh, tenured writer opinion, what does college football need to try and make the communication better and organize this? It's hard to say. You know, a lot of people say there should be a football czar to be in control of things, but there are so many competing interests within the sport of college football, within the Power Five, within the Power Five conferences themselves, that nobody can ever come to a unanimous agreement on things. And that's just kind of the way it is. College football has always been a regional sport with regional priorities and, and, and trying to figure it out from there. It's easy to say, hey, everybody wants to do this. Hey, you know, hey, Mac Brown would be a great guy to do it one day or something like that. But as some people have mentioned, as he mentioned it the other day, but everybody's going to have accusations of bias toward one thing. You need to have everybody come to an, an agreement on the, the NCAA is not an organization. It's a collection of the schools. There's obviously a lot of bureaucracy committees, different presidents, ADs on different things. It, it's very convoluted, but that's kind of the only way you can do it when you have what 300 teams in division one alone not to mention d2 and d3 it's kind of it's it's not like pro sports where you have 30 teams and they're all businesses and everybody gets paid and you can just have a players union and you figure it out college sports is very complicated it always has been from the beginning and i don't think there's a way you could set up one person to be in charge of one thing and get everybody to agree for that to happen fine i'll do it fine i'll do it (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Let's talk about how many games you really think are going to be played because I think it's great that they're pushing forward, trying to play 10 plus one or whatever, right? When, when all said and done, we don't know if we're going to have a Miami Marlins situation, right? Where up, oh, this team can't play or this team can't play suddenly. So how many games do you think we're going to actually get in on average? Man, I, I have no idea. I, I'm 50-50 at best that we even get to the season because you still have to have all the students come back to campus. And that's going to create it. So there are going to be outbreaks on certain campuses. Do those outbreaks reach the football teams? You know, is the NCAA going to cancel D- D3 and D2 next week? Or, or what about FCS? And does FBS go forward? Can a conference, hey, if, if one or two teams has an outbreak and they have to shut it down, will the conference move forward without them? The, these contingency plans need to be developed. Clearly, MLB did not have one. They were, they were figuring, figuring out the Marlins situation on the fly. You know, in, in baseball in Korea, when a team had an outbreak, basically things shut down for a few weeks and then they would come back. It's harder to do that in football when you have limited games. So I, I honestly have no idea. Like I said, I'm 50-50. We even get start of the season because there's going to be thousands and thousands of students coming to college campuses and we everybody knows how college students typically act and is that going to be a safe environment in terms of keeping people from getting the virus I could not give you a game. I just know that if we start and we get two or three games in and then they feel like they have to shut down, that may be the worst situation of of all the possibilities. Chris, great to catch up with you, man. We appreciate the insights. Uh, Enjoy your writing and your material. For those that uh, haven't experienced it, how can they find what you do? Yeah, just theathletic.com. Uh, we have a 40% off deal going on right now. Just click on any story and, and, and you get a, a discounted subscription. We got a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of college football news going on. So just check us out there. I can't wait to read about actual football games that you're reporting on. Only positive vibes here, Chris. Yes, absolutely. Thanks, man. Yeah, for having me. Chris Vanini on the Deseret First Credit Union Hotline. Deseret First, you know why we show how. It's got that COVID beard, man. It's looking good. I, I had an epiphany that I will share coming up a little later about the politics of each state and how that governs their decision relative to college football. I will share later. We don't have time. we got to go to break. They're like, go to break! <laughs> coming up. Could BYU possibly get something like Notre Dame with another league this year only? Let's explore it. Plus, the best to ever wear numbers 67 and 68 at BYU. This is BYU Sports Nation. Listen to BYU Sports Nation On Demand by downloading the podcast. Just Google BYU Sports Nation Podcast. 
Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. My name is Spencer Linton. This is Jerem Jordan, and it is time to whip it. It's time for the Cougar Whip Around. Athletics News. The ACC announces its football schedule model, which is 10 conference games and one non-conference game at home for each school. Notre Dame is included in the schedule and is eligible to play for the ACC title. They had an existing five-game-a-year relationship and a connection with the ACC's New Year's Six spot as well. Sports Illustrated reporting the almighty SEC is leaning towards a conference-only football schedule of 10 games. Presidents of all 14 Southeastern Conference institutions set to meet today and discuss the options. This obviously carries big ramifications for BYU with that potential season opener against Alabama on the line and the last Power 5 game BYU has remaining on the currently constituted schedule of seven games. Please make it manifest. is supposed to play in Prova this October. Yikes. Football. Utah State announces the transfer of Devontae Henry Cole to Logan after the Cougars signed the grad transfer running back from Utah. It's a fish. Cougars in pro hoops. Yesterday, sources indicating Jimmer Fredette would sign a $1.6 million deal with the Shanghai Sharks and return to play for the China and the CBA. But since that initial report surfaced, Jimmer's agent has denied any claims of a Jimmer agreement with Shanghai. So we'll wait and see what happens there. Fredette played last year in Greece with EuroLeague power Panathinaikos. That takes us to the best to ever wear it. Two numbers today. Double dip. Number 67 and 68 as we determine the best athletes to wear each number at BYU. If you like linemen, you're going to like today's number 67. Sete Aulai played okay. 2005 to 2007 and 06 on that 11 and 2 team. Sete was... All Mountain West Conference second team. He was credited with 108 knockdowns. Pancakes, the nickname. 108 for that? knockdowns. Knockdowns. I, that was on his bio. Okay. So how about how about that? Right. Started 26 consecutive games, junior and senior season. Again, when BYU's had a good offense, you can look at that offensive line, and they've been really good. And Sete Ally was one of those. The best way number 67. Okay, the lineman love continues at number 68 with Jason Sukanik. Vancouver, Washington. What's up? It's not Skukanik. It's Sukanik. Skanik. From 1997 to 2001. Hey, not a bad little run there. All Mountain West Conference first team in 2001. Watch the reviewable show on that 01 season. It was memorable if you're not familiar with it. Started 25 consecutive games. I'm always impressed by these numbers with offensive linemen specifically. Oh, man. Yeah, they're, they're, uh, they're bruising each other every play. I, I'm shocked when they... Miss a game because they're so tough, right? I know that Jason loves frozen peas. We know that. That he does. Yeah. Radio we, personality we in the Northwest. Uh, great personality. Signed as a free agent with the Denver Broncos in 2001 following his All-Mountain West Conference first team season. Jason Sukanik, the best to ever wear number 68 at BYU. Okay, coming up is pairing with another conference, a possibility for BYU this season. Yes, can BYU follow the Notre Dame and ACC model and be accepted with open arms into a willing conference. Too much. So. This is BYU Sports Nation. <laughs> BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, the official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. The best of BYU Sports Nation airs Saturdays at noon Eastern, 9 Pacific on BYU Radio, and on the podcast feed as well, featuring the best conversations and interviews each week. The goal is that we always have that show because that means there was something that was the best of. <laughs> if we don't have it, that means there wasn't anything good. So, so far, so good, which is good. Hopefully, uh, those fantastic individuals compiling those are, are not having to look very deep to find great things, right? No, Cole, Cole Wissinger is the man. He's the man. Welcome back to BYU Sports Nation in Studio B. Our, now, uh, our question now is, can BYU football do something like Notre Dame and the ACC and come to an agreement with a conference that would be open to bringing BYU in for at least a year. I, and I know the idea of the Big 12 was floated out there yesterday. It seems fantastic, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. The Big 12 and BYU finally come together for the greater good of college football. Mutually beneficial. BYU brings all their... Uh, prestige and ESPN money, whatever that is. We don't know the specific number because BYU doesn't have to tell anybody what that is. But 
Then they would give uh, another guaranteed game to all of these Big 12 teams that want to play closer to a full schedule. So it makes perfect sense, right, Jeremy? How viable is BYU to the Big 12 for one year, a la Notre Dame to the ACC is? Uh, It's not. BYU's not Notre Dame. (laughs) This isn't going to happen. The Mountain West doesn't want to deal with BYU, and BYU doesn't want to deal with the Mountain West. They got divorced, and it was kind of ugly, okay? Uh, visitation rights, uh, you know, alimony. It was messy, right? No. Uh, BYU's not Notre Dame and never will be. It, they just won't be that. I don't believe that BYU would get something with the Big 12, but I would welcome that. I would love that. Of course. I just don't think that it really benefits the Big 12 that much. They can, they can, they can find the individual games. I don't think they want every, you know, to bring BYU in. Also, it looks like they somehow would favor BYU when they clearly flirted with and denied BYU several years ago. And several other programs. Right. Mainly just like Houston and Cincinnati or something, right? No, I don't, I don't see this happening. It says possible pairing. Can we scratch, scratch that out and say not possible pairing? The Big 12 I, inclusion I, is a pipe dream. I don't believe. It was just a tease from us. It's not real. It I, would be I, amazing. I, yeah, it would be awesome. It would be awesome. And trust me, I would even take a Mountain West relationship yeah, sure. this year because of the level of desperation associated with a schedule. Right now, BYU is in a big pickle trying to figure out how this is going to work because BYU is looking around going, Okay, who's, what plan are we doing? Are we doing the we have some Power 5 games, some G5 games schedule? Are we doing the we only have G5 game schedule? Or are we doing the we only have independence schedule? Obviously, the only independence schedule is the worst one. But if it's the only one that BYU can do, I would welcome it. I'm not opposed to that because guess what? We're all crazy desperate, and we're like Tyler Algier running with one shoe. We're just hoping just keep rolling. we can play. Yes, in some capacity. Lost the wheel, just keep going. Just keep Run going. Run on the axle. <laughs> That's what it's going to be in October, <laughs> man. The Big 12 is a pipe dream. Yes, it would be so fun. But I think BYU getting a game with a Big 12 opponent was probably the best case scenario <laughs> given everything that's happening. Just sure. one game with a Big 12 opponent. Yeah. However, the Mountain West Conference scenario intrigues me. I don't want BYU to go back to the Mountain West Conference permanently, but because of everything that's happening right now and because Notre Dame just did this with the ACC and BYU already has three Mountain West Conference opponents on the 2020 schedule, I don't think it would be that much of a stretch for them to say, hey, it makes sense, it's regional, Uh, it would allow us to have uh, some high-profile games on ESPN if these teams are playing at BYU. Maybe the Cougars throw in their ESPN money as a sweetener for the deal, and they say, yeah, okay. I'm trying not to laugh. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Like I know that they don't like each other. They've got a really rough history. But how often have we been in this pandemic scenario? And the Mountain West Conference said, oh, we're not going to work with BYU. Yet here we are, BYU – year in and year out, have a handful of games against that's, Mountain West Conference teams. That's individually negotiated with those teams. The Mountain West has nothing to do with that. Does the Mountain that's West Conference? That's a non-conference game. I mean, does, does BYU's amount of money from ESPN carry any weight to, a group, not to a group that, of five conference? BYU's not tossing that. But way. if it meant inclusion in a conference and the ability to guarantee a schedule and play for a conference championship, don't you think that there, that would at least be considered? Not really. Uh, no, really, the relationship is so tenuous that I don't see in any form this happening. That BYU has BYU does not have a relationship with the Mountain West. They have a relationship with teams who are in the Mountain West. A majority of the teams in the Mountain West. Yeah, well, of course they all hung out. They know each other. They're friends, um, and some you're not friends with, but you will still hang out with, like Let's Wyoming say, later. San Diego example. State's on the schedule this year. I wouldn't say I would say that San Diego State and BYU are pretty friendly, actually. It's 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 Rocky Long independently. And don't you think Boise State and San Diego State carry the most weight though, being the two most prominent programs in the Mountain West right now? It's Boise State and everybody else. Okay, well BYU yeah. has a great relationship with Boise State. So if Boise State, who just lost Florida State, by the way, a home game in Boise. Right. Goodbye that to gonna, that. That was gonna be goodbye awesome. to that. Don't you think Boise is now like, okay, we absolutely need BYU on the schedule so that we can have something, something that brings added interest to but our they, home schedule. They already are on this. 
but the if, schedule. What's the issue? Well, my my thing is, what if the Mountain West is like, well, we we don't really like BYU. We're going to go conference only. So say goodbye to that. It wouldn't have anything to do with I BYU. Think, it would just be, are we going to do conference? only? But I think not? Boise would fight back and be like, no, 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 no. There needs to be a plus one. We need BYU on the schedule. Well, it's in the best interest of the G5s to do a plus one. Exactly. If they want some money, I would think, right? Another game, a little more money, like that. That I don't think that BYU is as powerful in this conversation as maybe we're alluding to, I don't know, or people think. I, I think BYU is looking around going, who will take us? We'll play. Let's go. We'll, okay. we'll play anybody. Well, and on let's, that note, don't go. you, because they are desperate, don't you think, hey, Mountain West, what can we work out? But not in a formal sense. You just get more G5s. Like, if BYU loses Missouri, then I, there are schools that BYU has a relationship with because they were in a league, the WAC and the Mountain West, and some just the Mountain West, for a long time, that obviously there's a relationship there. And you play. BYU's played a lot of the Mountain West teams. BYU hasn't played Wyoming quite yet, Colorado State, Air Force, but Wyoming's on the schedule. I, there, will, there will never be anything formal with the Mountain West Conference. Ever. Never say never. I, I don't think that it will ever happen. Here's why. The two have way too much pride. Okay. BYU. You, you often don't speak in absolutes. This is an I, absolute for Only me. since speak in absolutes. I think this is a moment where... I think this is a moment where uh, it's pretty clear that they're not going to work together at some point, ever. I, I just don't see it hmm. because the ex- the relationship is still too raw. It's only been a decade since BYU left, but, <laughs> it's but a decade. But a decade in the history of these uh, with these schools and whatnot is uh, not a ton. Cause a long time. I they in the six like sixties to two thousand. That was a long time. The Mountain West Conference. BYU was only in the Mountain West Conference for essentially a decade. Like yeah. th- think but, about that. Uh, Almost all of those teams were in the whack together, right? They have a long-standing relationship. I don't, yeah, is pairing with another conference a possibility for BYU? No. I, I just – I would love this to happen. I just don't see it. It's every conference for itself. BYU, BYU wants to get in the club, and they don't have an invite, and they don't know, one, know anyone on the inside per se. They have to say, just tell us what you're going to do, and then we will schedule who we can schedule, and we'll go from there. Tom Homo, we know from our conversations with him – on the air and, and otherwise, is that he is prepared, which is the good news. He is prepared for any scenario here. He's got multiple schedules, ready to go, conversations, relationships. He's been at this a long time, and uh, he'll play the best schedule he can. I've argued that he plays too good of a schedule, right, in the past. So I'm not necessarily worried about that. I'm worried about what everyone else does. Okay. I'm going to tell you what I think is going to happen, given the circumstances that are playing out this very second. BYU is going to keep the six games against group of five teams or FCS on the schedule right now. North Alabama might change just because there's a significant distance for that team to travel, and the Cougars might end up playing a Weber State play or a Southern Utah, Utah, Idaho team. State. Yeah, yeah. There will be a close team for the FCS game, but I think BYU will keep the five group of five games it has on the schedule right now. Uh, based on the direction that these conferences are going. And I think that the group of fives are going to be more like the ACC. Uh, conference only plus one, and, and they'll keep BYU. BYU will create some interest, and I think ESPN carries a little bit of a heavy stick in this as well. I hope they can help, right? That's part they, of the I reason you have help. that relationship. Now, I trust Tom Homo and his contacts that he's going to go out and contact – any team available in a Power 5 conference that will still do a plus one. I think the Big 12 is clearly, based on what they have said in the last few weeks, looking for a team like BYU. So, yes. BYU... Will they play a road game, though? It, hey, maybe BYU has to go to Stillwater. BYU just have to go on play, the road They play Oklahoma times. State. They go yeah. to Chestnut Hill, and they take advantage of the ACC exception, and they play Boston College in week four. Maybe Tom can talk... Uh, if the SEC is like, hey, we'll do a plus one. And I don't know what the SEC is going to do, but it kind of feels like they would be, you can come here and play us. You know? Yeah. Like Missouri will say, well, we're not coming to Provo. That's typically what they do anyway. BYU has not hosted a ton of SEC teams in the past. Yeah. That's because the SEC teams don't feel like they need to travel that okay. far right, for non-conference games. So they if, can just play locally. If BYU has one FCS, they play the five well, group of five. They might need to play two. And they can to yeah. get bowl eligible, assuming well, bowl games What happen. do bowl games look like? Jeez. NCAA waivers all over the place. Cheese and bowl's like, what are we yeah. doing? So those six games remaining – Maybe BYU goes to Missouri, they go to Boston College, they go to Oklahoma State, and, I don't know, a good relationship with a Mountain West team comes to the surface and they say, hey, let's add this game. Okay, now you've got your 10-game schedule tentatively. Um, 
Tom Homo is going to be able to figure something out. That's what I really yeah, think no is doubt. going to happen. No doubt. They're going to hold on to the majority of the group of five games they still have. They'll broker something with the Big 12, maybe something with the ACC. You're saying with teams in the Big 12. Correct. Not the Big 12. The, no, no, no. Teams I think there's a the difference. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't think that a formal – that's what we're talking about, is a formal – A game or two. Relationship a like Notre Dame had. BYU does not have that power. If this was BYU in 1987, BYU would have that power. But it's 2020. It's, that's not the case. So, yeah, I'm, I'm excited for Tom Homo to do his magic. We're going to see – what Tom Hummel can do. We, we've seen it be some impressive schedules, right? This will be his finest hour, perhaps, in figuring out what BYU can get. There are reports of BYU and the athletic department talking with a team like Oklahoma State. I do not think that is off the table. Talking with is not a big deal to me, I, I, whether you schedule them or not. Well, I think that scheduling a team like that is a very course, high, of, high possibility. Of course they're talking. That's yeah, with, great. with the rhetoric that is out there now. So We're I, the kings of talk preseason. BYU, go and win. You know what I mean? It's like, that's what really matters. Okay, coming up, today's Rise and Shadow. And it's day four, whether you want it or not, of coaches on bikes. What did Preston Hadley and Gennaro Guilford have for us today, Jerem? They get through that flat tire scenario yesterday? Okay, looks like it. This is BYU Sports Nation. I want the smoke. We know that. Welcome back to BYU Sports Nation. With this daily reminder, our show is available anytime you want it on demand via the BYU TV and BYU Radio applications. Or download the podcast. Just Google BYU Sports Nation podcast. Jerem. Hi. We've saved the best for last. We have? Maybe. Oh, you, we'll let the fans decide. I still got to get my epiphany in here. It's day four and the latest, greatest edition of Coaches on Bikes. Coach G, what, what's your assessment of yesterday? Oh, man. We got a bunch of jungle tigers out there. Ooh. Ain't nothing given. Ain't nothing given. We go hunt for everything. That's what we do. That's what we build for, baby. Let's go. Enough said. <laughs> <laughs> Coaches on bikes. That's funny. Gennaro Guilford. It's still going. That's good. Preston Hadley. I said over under four and a half days, so if they do it tomorrow, they, they got the over. Now, if you're uh, new to this little segment, um, every day... They're the coaches on bikes. BYU secondary coaches, Gennaro Guilford over the <laughs> cornerbacks and Preston Hadley over the safeties, have decided to bike to work. Yeah. They want all the smoke. They're going to hunt for everything on those bikes. I don't want the smoke because they're riding bikes. Okay, here's my epiphany. So when I look at a map of red and blue states... Political. The, politically. The blue states... Democratic, mm-hmm. are the Pac-12 and a lot of the Big Ten mm-hmm. states. Mm-hmm. They're the ones that came out first said, no, 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 keep it tight. Let's play this a, a little safer. The Republican states are like, we don't need a mask. Well, let's just play 10 plus 1. Are you suggesting you know what that I mean? politics have a say in sports, Jerem? The Republican states are obviously a little more aggressive with the approach here, which is let's play a few more games and let's do non-conference, right, which may have you cross to another state or whatever. The ACC is kind of in the middle. They're kind of in the middle of this. Yes, the eight, well, they're depending m- on where you are. Yeah, they're mostly Republican-ish. Yeah, but yeah, just barely a majority. Mm-hmm. But it, it's interesting. It's interesting that if I, I could finally quantify it. Like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Why they did that well, and I'm, why they're doing this. So expect the Big Twelve, like they've said, to want to play more games. We've been saying this for a while because they're the I don't need a mask conference right now <laughs> let's play 12 <laughs> and let's have fans like wait what see on september 5th with fifty thousand fans I, i'm the mask guy yeah i'm wear a mask guy except for here i guess a question of the day taking into consideration <laughs> what we know now what do you want to see BYU do with their football schedule our elite voice of the day presented by sundance mountain resort comes in from at x underscore hems on twitter okay hear me out all junior college schedule. Get out of here. Hello. After each game, BYU talks to the best players from each school, yada, yada, yada. Next few years, BYU's roster is stacked. Okay. Today's Rise and Shout Building for the I'm future. Out. Today's Rise and Shout Out. Uh, Daniel Sorensen repping the Y uh, back in Kansas City. Repping uh, s- some of that BYU cloth, no, man. Head, head to toe, man. Head to toe. So he has socks on? Well, he's got, I don't know if they're BYU socks. Oh. Knowing Danny, they might be. Yeah. But uh, he's got his BYU tights on, his BYU shorts, the royal blue BYU T-shirt. Yeah. Dirty Dan back in KC doing work. Okay, so earlier in the show I said BYU's not Notre Dame and never will be. 
at Chandler J U T said, "Why not? Thanks for nothing." Do I really need to explain why not? He just wants you to have some hope, Jerem. I do have hope. I also have reality. <laughs> That's got to come out on this program sometimes, you know. Like we can't just we can't just talk it up like it's going to be great all the time. It's not great right now, BYU. Jeff. It's BYU not great. Big Twelve, Jerem. You're always not Notre Dame. You're always BYU. BYU. You're always BYU. We don't want to be Notre Dame. You're always BYU. BYU. Hey, our thanks to today's guest, Chris Vanini of The Athletic. Sorry to Dennis Pitta and Chandler and Jeff Chandler. Sorry to disappoint you. What would Dennis say about your hating on BYU is not Notre Dame? I like Dennis the player, you know? To Jeremiah Spencer, shout out to Chris Badger. See you tomorrow on BYUSN. Go (laughs) Cougs. Well played.